Well, we hate talking about it, but we got to talk about it. Uh, Shane Bieber, Spencer Strider, maybe Jonathan Loizaga. It sucks. And welcome to baseball in 2024. By the way, hey, it's a just baseball show. Monday, April 8th, it is presented by BetMGM, Jack McMullen, RM Layton. We got to talk about the TJ influx. I would like good news off the top. Uh, Skip Schumacher, bad news again. What the hell? And then minor league opening weekend, which is fun. Um, I also want to sprinkle in some Yoshinobu Yamamoto because he is not washed. He's been really good. <laughs> His first two starts after domestic opening Shocker. Day. Why don't we, do you want to start with that? Or do you want yes. to say like, hey, man, how are you? No, I, okay. I'm just like disclaimer. And I, it's probably partly because I'm tired. Um, and so I might be a little grumpy, but. I think there's going to be a theme on this show. I'm just going to be a little bit of a curmudgeon today. But, but like, of, of all the topics, I'm, I have a lot of things that are bothering me in yeah. all different facets, and I'm just going to be miserable on the podcast today. So just bear with me. Uh, hopefully you enjoy it, but there's just a lot of things that are like bothering me right now. And and I appreciate the forewarning. Um, the Yamamoto conversation is like is positive at its core, mm -hmm. but it may sound like you're dunking on the haters. So I want to like give you the floor and let you dunk on the haters. Well, so it's not even about that. I just, and I don't know if it's like the affinity for just seeing the Dodgers stink, you know, because of, of what they did this offseason. Like, I get people, it. People I, love that. And like, I don't really get that. I get rooting against the big money, but like people are preying on our modern Babe Ruth's downfall yeah, and they're correct. preying on the $325 million like ace. They're, pre they're preying on him to suck. And I'm like, yeah, what? That that's where it's weird to me. So like, I can totally understand wanting to see the Dodgers lose. Everybody needs a villain, and and you know, growing up a Miami sports fan, like watching how much you know, people hated the Miami Heat, and yeah. it was I get it. I would hate them too. Uh, but when you look at just the way that it's going down now, is interesting. Where people, you know, a lot of people want Shohei to be guilty. Uh, people wanted Yamamoto to be this catastrophic bust. Uh, and, and I just think things like that are, are so weird to me. I, you know, if I was a giants fan or whatever, like, sure, I wouldn't want Yamamoto to look like the best pitcher on planet earth. But yeah. I, I felt like there was a lot of neutral fans that just were very eager to say, Oh yeah. See these guys from Japan, like other than Otani, who we want to be guilty for other things, they, they can't come over and succeed. Like it's just a different, you know, it's a different sport over here. And it, it is, but there's also freak talents out there that can perform at the big league level in, in, in major league baseball. And I just think it's super silly that we had all of this discourse around him when, you know, we have so many different prospects that around the same age come up and have plenty of struggles. And yeah, I think people aren't great about being patient with prospects either, but usually are a little bit more patient with them. Yeah. Um, it, it ended up just boiling down to Yamamoto tipping his pitches. And I don't think that they had as much of an emphasis on picking those things up. I'm, I'm, I might be speaking out of turn there. I'm not sure how much, you know, teams in, in, you know, the, the MPB like to, to dive into, you know, tipping pitches and things like that and trying to identify that. But in major league baseball, they got people that that's literally their job is to try to find these things. So it was picked up pretty quickly. And Yamamoto is the kind of guy that if you can find that edge, you need it because there's so many different ways that he can attack you. So I, I, it really was just him tipping pitches. Now he's not. And clearly hitters are very uncomfortable. He's filling up the zone. He's extremely confident. And when the smartest or one of the smartest organizations in Major League Baseball spends over $300 million on a pitcher that has yet to pitch in Major League Baseball, mm -hmm. I'm going to imagine that he isn't going to suck. Yes. And it turns out he is not going to suck. He's And guess good. what? It wasn't a market reaction either. It wasn't a, oh shit, like this guy got, oh, Rodon got 168 last year. Like, oh, we got to, we got to double that for Yamamoto. It wasn't that. He was that good. Roki Sasaki, if he waits and if he dominates like we think he could, he might be that good. But the fact is Sawamura had, or sorry, he had Sawamura awards. Yamamoto had Sawamura awards. Yamamoto had MVPs. He had pitching triple crowns under his belt. He was one of the most successful pitchers in NPB history. Mm -hmm. And you look at Masahiro Tanaka being worth every penny of 155 for the Yankees. There are, you Darvish is on his third nine-figure deal. You look at the success coming over from Nippon Professional Baseball and you see the guy that is the most successful. It's not it's not a reaction. It's not 325. And you and you don't have that kind of success for that long of a time by accident. No. Uh, and 
So now the one thing I do want to see now is Yamamoto get stretched out further. And that's yeah. going to be the thing to monitor. Uh, you know, he had a little bit of like that rain delay situation in the other game. And then for whatever reason, you know, they didn't really want to leave him in there. He threw, I think it was more just the, the game cadence and the way things went. He only threw 80 pitches against the Cubs, but it's five innings, a scoreless ball, eight Ks and two walks. I just want to see him stretched out. We know he can do it. I mean, in, in NPB, he was throwing anything's final out of the, end of the season. He threw 138 pitches pretty much every single outing. He was over 110, but I'm just excited to see that now at the major league level because does the fastball maybe flatten out a little bit more once he gets to 90, 100 pitches where he could have got away with that a bit more You know, in Japan. Those are the little things, but I, I think that's the only things you're looking at right now. With the Yoshinobu Yamamoto, you know that the baseline pretty much is a, a walking quality start, uh, yeah. and it's it's really fun to watch. Like he is again, I I'm not sitting here rooting for the, the Dodgers to dominate baseball and uh, and and turn into like this just one man race, which it won't be because that's why we play the games. But I, I I am rooting for Yamamoto because every time I watch him out there, I mean it's it's captivating, and I don't care who who you root for. You're, you know, if he's in town, you should go watch and you won't regret it. Like, it, there's really something special about what he does on the mound. Dude, what was the best thing to happen to Miami Marlins ticket sales in the mid 2000, in the mid 2010s? Every, every time Jose Fernandez took the ball. I will tell you, and you experienced that firsthand. Like, you went to a ballpark that was somewhat filled at least versus an empty ballpark the other four days. Well, I'll tell yeah. you, yeah. Go ahead. No, I'll tell you firsthand. Like, I could, go to an empty ballpark on non-sale days when sale was at the peak of his powers in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And when sale got going and when sale got right, that ballpark doubled in attendance for sale mm -hmm. days. Like there's something beautiful about elite starting pitching. And there's something that drives eyeballs to TV sets and drives butts to seats with elite starting pitching. And I grew up enamored with elite starting pitching. You grew up enamored with elite starting pitching. There are so many baseball people out there that nothing brings them pure joy like a great starting pitcher. We've got the next great starting pitcher, possibly, possibly, mm -hmm. in the game, literally debuting like a couple weeks ago. And I see a section of the internet trying to shit on him and, and preying on his downfall. I yeah. don't get it. Yeah, no, it's 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 weird stuff, especially because I, I love the way he kind of goes about his business. I think he's a lot yeah, of fun. He's funny. Uh, <laughs> like, have you seen all the funny. clips? Like, he's funny. Yeah, I you know, it, it's it's funny to the last thing I'll say about it is, you know, going back to the point about the Dodgers just, you know, feeling really. I mean, of course, it's a risk whenever you guys haven't thrown a pitch in Major League Baseball, but, you know, calculated risk because there's a lot of things. They had way more access to information than we had. And just yeah. the data that I had and the things that I was able to put together with him, it was like, OK, yeah, he's. He's going to be good. Uh, mm -hmm. And clearly they were able to do that to the nth degree. Yeah. But I was listening to, I forget which broadcast it was, but there was discussion, I think, amongst broadcasters that the, the general belief is that Yamamoto could have got more money. And I think his agent, Joel Wolf, was saying I, that he felt like he could have squeezed out even more because yeah. it became such a frenzy. But Yamamoto just was like, I've had enough like of this whole process. I want to be a Dodger. I'm just going to, let's just take it. Let's not get cute with it. Mm -hmm. And I believe it. And, and that that's just another reason though. If, if you have several teams just all in on this guy, I mean, that's all in. Clearly they all see the same thing. And I'm, I'm excited to watch this guy just continue to get better because it's uh, it's special to watch him when he's dialed in. We saw with Kodai Senga, even with his ghost fork, just the, yeah. what he has done to like bring some excitement when he pitches, how much Mets fans enjoy watching him on the bump. It, there, there's just something fun when it's different and Yamamoto is different. And there's always, it's it's baseball's better when you have different pitchers, different players doing different things that yeah. give you a, a fresh taste, you know, every, every fifth day uh, that you don't always get to see. Yeah. So there is like really no good way to transition from Yoshinobu Yamamoto appreciating him to the next topic. Like if I tried to transition, I would sound like an asshole, but um, I am going to call back Kodai Senga for this, like Kodai Senga, a guy that was amazing to watch dealing with arm issues during spring training shut down. Um, if you were under a rock this weekend, Shane Bieber needs Tommy John in his contract here. So Bieber shuts down after two excellent, excellent starts out West. After that, Spencer Strider's MRI came back and noted structural damage to his UCL. So he's going to, to Keith Meister, I think, for a second opinion. And who knows? That guy might might be TJ'd up. Jonathan Loisega, I think, needs an internal brace done. It's not mm -hmm. TJ, but it sounds like it's UCL damage, and he may need an internal brace done. That all happened on the same day, which was four to five days after Yuri Perez 
had his Tommy John done by Keith Meister. So we're talking about Perez, Bieber, and Strider all dealing with UCL issues. We had a guy working his way back from his second Tommy John on the pod every week last week. He's going to be on again this week or last year, and he's going to be on again uh, this week at some point. I mean, you could put together the all-star team of guys that are currently on the shelf. Shane McClanahan, Sandy Alcantara, even a guy like Felix Bautista who needed TJ. I mean, Jacob deGrom is working his way back. Everybody's already listed the names. But again, what's killing me is there are a lot of doctors on the internet, or at least people that want to be doctors on the internet. And not only trying to scream at the cloud and say, this is bad, we should fix it. They think they know why it's happening. And let me break this to you. There's no one reason why this is happening. You put a bunch of shit in a stew, you bring it to a simmer, you stir it up, it's going to taste like TJ. And that's what we got right now. Yeah. So I I agree with that. I think there's a lot of factors being mixed in here that, that can contribute. But I also think that there's just the very clear cut answer here, which we've always known and just continues to be uh, echoed by the smartest sports medicine minds that we have, which is the direct correlation between velocity and Tommy John surgery. And here's the thing. People are are all, you know, you talk about just like a bunch of, of people getting their medical degree over the last week, you know, and, and, and when I talk about this, like I try to be aware of that where I don't want to try to sound like I, I'm some expert doctor. I don't know anything about medicine, but I did pass the ACT portion or the, the reading comprehension portion of my ACT. Mm-hmm. And there are endless peer reviewed write-ups and, and different articles and different I mean, there's so much out there, whether it's James Andrews, whether it's uh, Keith Meister's probably written some things. Again, yeah, Ellen Trost has written stuff. Yeah, like there's all. peer-reviewed stuff everywhere. And they all agree that velocity is the most damaging thing to a UCL, especially if you are under the age of, of 26. And guess what? Pitchers are throwing harder than ever at younger ages than ever. And That's going to be a part in this. So I I think it's just interesting. I think when people use these opportunities to kind of push an agenda, like it's, it's not a coincidence that the people who didn't like the pitch clock are now the most ready to just slap this as a a pitch clock issue. Pitch clock may be a contributor. Sure. You you have less recovery time. You're pushing your body a little bit more. You get more fatigued. Fatigued pitches are extremely you know, damaging sticky substances, you know, not, not being able to grip the ball the same way the seams being adjusted. I'm sure that that could be a contributor, but when you have legitimately the smartest minds and, and here's a quote that, that this was on James Andrews website uh, yeah. back from 2016, I believe. And this is the quote, the correlation between velocity and injury risk is at least as strong as the correlation between velocity and performance says Glenn Fleisig, the Fleisig. research yeah, director Glenn Fleisig has, worked in Birmingham with James Andrews. Yeah. The American sports medicine Institute, the yeah, research in director there. So yeah, I'm not going to pretend to be a doctor, but I can pretend to read. I can read. And everything that I read from people that are doctors seems to say that, Velocity is the huge problem here. I hate citing that when there's no solution to that because also, you know, kids are not only throwing harder now, they're throwing harder than ever at a younger age. And, you know, you're pushing your body to the brink at 18 years old uh, that we just haven't seen before. But what's the alternative? What are you going to tell them not to, not to throw as hard? There's, there's no solution. So I hate providing a problem with no solution, but I also think it's it's silly to scapegoat other things. I think there should be a ton of research done to see if the pitch clock is contributing a million yeah. percent. Because if there's any way that we can mitigate this, even by a couple percentage points, and you know, across the board, we need all the help that we can get in baseball right now. However, I think it's almost hurting when you just blame it on one thing or just blame it on something that, you know, lazily and before we really have research done on it. I think we should find out. But I also think it's crazy to ignore all the research we've done in the past because there's new rules now and because there's new rules that could have changed things. It's a variable. And now we need to study how the variable impacted things. I, I think we're hurting ourselves by throwing out all of the previous research that has been echoed again by the smartest minds. Yes. Uh, you just dropped some bars. Like, that's why I was really smiling through that. I was just like, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was awesome. And 
I have said this, I feel like in some form or fashion on this show, I probably haven't said it as clear as I'm going to 15 times. And whenever people like ask me that aren't really big baseball fans they are like, why are elbow issues becoming such a thing? Because you'll see it. It's a it's a story that is at this point transcending baseball fans. It's getting into non-baseball fans feeds. And they're just like, why is this going on? And the way that I can put it as simply as possible is this. Yes, guys are throwing as hard as they ever have. And velocity and, and elbow issues go hand in hand. But are you actually, and they're like, can't you avoid that? Can't like, can't these guys just stop throwing this hard? This is the thing that I want to make abundantly clear. They don't make a hundred million dollars for throwing 90. They don't get to the big leagues by throwing 88. You don't get a scholarship for throwing 85 anymore. Come like, on. Like, let's man. acknowledge this. Is showcase culture, is showcase culture ruining baseball? It depends how you look at it. Is it becoming a more explosive game? It is. Is that a good thing? For numbers, yes. It's a numerically driven game. Yeah. And numerically driven games need numbers that look really good. And that's fastball velocity. That's 60 yard dash times. That's EV. And dude, like it's it's anything that will get spit out. Yeah. And at this point, a college will rather take a guy that sprays 90 than a kid that dots 75. Or dots 80. Dots 80. Dots I'd have the kid that throws 90 because yes. people can't hit 90. People no. can hit 80. At well, the college and, level, they can't hit 100. No. And, and the fact that we have 100 at the college level, think about it even anecdotally. I don't have the data in front of me in terms of what the average college velocity has been, you know, year over year. But I can I can promise you that they've seen probably as much of a jump as – as any level of, of baseball in terms of, of percentage points. And the other thing that I think is really important to note here is you also have, I think, a world where coaches can't get out and recruit as much as they used to. It, nope. It's just the budget. It's inefficient. So a lot of the way that these players get recruited is either one, the showcase or two, they just throw on video on, on, you know, with a track man and they send that data over and you get a scholarship offer just based on that. You're emptying the freaking tank. In, in that situation, you, you played summer ball. You know, when we used to do those like perfect game tournaments, dude, I mean, I had so many teammates that, you know, and you don't care about winning at summer ball. I didn't give, I didn't give a crap about winning guys would go out on the mound because they would track your velocity and it would get uploaded to your account. You know, your perfect game profile afterwards, mm -hmm. and you'd get ranked, even if they didn't, you didn't perform in a showcase. If you threw 90 in a game, perfect game, just, you know, tournament game, you're going to be a top 1000 player, whatever it may be. I mean, I would be out there standing at third base and guy would just walk the world and we'd get back to the dugout and he'd be like, yo, I got, I, I hit 91 that inning. And I'm like, and I, you know what? I don't blame him. Yeah. That's gonna like, get good him. for you. Clemson doesn't care that he walked the world. They're looking at the, the 91 and, and that's, what's going to get him an opportunity. Um, I, I think that's the part of it where it's not a major league. It is a major league baseball problem because major league baseball is the pinnacle yeah, of the sport. The end goal. Yeah. But this is a problem that is rooted from the bottom to the top. That's why James Andrews has created guidelines for 12 U yeah. uh, to, to be able to. You know, Dude, just I, I, saw arm a quote, I saw a quote resurface. And by the way, I've been bugging you to read the arm by Jeff Passan. Yeah. Like there is no better time for me to push my agenda here. Like, Go buy that book. Like, let's get Jeff Passan some royalties here. He wrote it when he was at Yahoo. I think it came out in 2016. He chronicles John Lester's free agency in this book. He mentions that there's a two-way talent in Japan named Shohei Otani that's going to come stateside for a lot of money. This is before any of this shit happened. And we're having the same fucking conversation <laughs> eight years later. Sucks. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm definitely going to read it. Uh, and, and I think... It's it's one of those things that's now like you know relevant. It's always going to be relevant. It's always but, relevant. The, the last thing I want to mention though is you have a world I think where, of course, we're going to look at Major League Baseball and the variables there and say, okay, um, well now pitch clock is added and you know we have some confirmation bias because we continue to see you know, these top arms go down. But I think when you operate that way and it kind of ties back to my initial point, you're ignoring it's it's almost operating under the assumption that every UCL enters Major League Baseball perfectly intact with no wear and tear. Wow. And then what's happening in Major League Baseball is causing these injuries. Right. Like I think that's the part that's getting lost is 
these guys, especially these major league pitchers, have been throwing 95 since they were in a lot of them, even since they were in high school or early in college. And when I look at this quote from James Andrews, and and this is the one that like really reminds me, and this might be a little extreme, but I, I think it's just puts things in perspective. This is from years and years ago. This was a quote. These kids are throwing 90 miles per hour their junior year of high school, he says. The ligament itself can't withstand that kind of force. We've learned in our research lab that baseball is a developmental sport. The Tommy John ligament matures at about age 26. In high school, the red line where the forces go beyond the the properties of the ligament that they can handle is about 80 miles per hour. So I think, you know, most of those kids can handle more than that. And it's not saying that it's just going to snap immediately, but it is putting wear and tear and stress on your arm before you're even getting to college or getting to professional ball. Uh, So I think that part of it's kind of ignored. And I'd imagine that exceeding that threshold that James Andrews has mentioned is probably more damaging than a fully developed arm throwing more frequently in terms of time intervals. Like, And again, I think it could contribute, but I would venture to say that throwing 90 at age 17 uh-huh. or 93 at age 17 is more damaging than throwing a pitch every 18 seconds instead of every 25 seconds. Correct. It might still contribute, but I, I think we've really lost sight of, of what the majority of the issue is. I don't know what the fix is, but we have to look from a youth all the way up to now. And I think major league baseball, the same way that they, you know, are, are looking to, you know, engage, I think baseball in inner cities and things like that, which I think is a really important initiative. I think another initiative that they should really spearhead now is arm care and arm health for young players, um, Mm -hmm. you know, all the way through. And I don't know how you do that. I don't know what the plan is the same way the NFL does things with, with youth football to mitigate concussions and, you know, whether it's showy or not, I think that's the the avenue they need to start going down because these players, it's it's only going to get worse. You have the next wave of kids that are throwing harder at a younger age. And it's just going to continue to get worse. Dude, I mean, we we like Charlie Soto because Charlie Soto was throwing ninety eight at a college, right? Like, or at a high, at a high school. school. Yeah, yeah. Brandon Brandon Barrera, who's in the Blue Jays system, like he was a first round pick because he was throwing ninety eight from the left side at a high school you, in South Florida. Did you see what happened yesterday? He got, yeah, he I think he left. He walked yeah. off the mound. Come on, Almost man. Come on. Yeah, I want to read you an excerpt from Dylan Cease's Wikipedia page because I think Cease is actually a pretty good example of this and. Had a had a pretty honest conversation with me and, and Taylor Davis um, last year. Cease attended Milton High School in Milton, Georgia. Pitching for the school's baseball team, his fastball velocity averaged 91 to 95 while peaking at 98 miles per hour. In August 2013, prior to Cease's senior year at Milton, Jonathan Mayo of MLB.com considered Cease to be a potential first-round draft pick in the upcoming 2014 MLB draft. Cease left the game. Cease left a game during his senior season on March 3rd due to elbow soreness, which was later diagnosed as a partial tear of the ulnar collateral ligament of the elbow of his pitching arm. He then went from a projected first round pick to signing for 1.5 in the sixth round with the Cubs. He fell five rounds. So, yeah, was he a potential first round pick because he was throwing 98 in high school? Yes. Did he fall to the sixth because he blew out? Yes. If we're going to reward what will push your body to the brink, somehow there's discipline for it. Somehow there are ramifications for pushing your body too far, which is Mm -hmm. ridiculous. So that's the last thing I want to say on velocity. I do want to point to like the one thing that I think Major League Baseball might have screwed up. Um, I don't think it's the pitch clock. I, I don't. And the Players Association could believe that the pitch clock is a contributing factor. I could absolutely see it as a contributing factor, but I don't yes. view it as the primary factor. No, exactly. And that's the distinction I think is really important. Because again, yeah. if, if you can, if it rectifies the issue by a few percentage points, then yeah, let, let's explore it. But for sure. the, the correlation between velo and injury is too strong for it to ever be a secondary factor. Right. So velo is the primary factor. I view the pitch clock as the tertiary factor. What I view as the secondary factor is... What we cracked down on, it was either 2021 or 2022. I think it was 2022. Isn't that crazy this, how much time flies where you can board? You could convince me it was any of those years. No idea. But it was the substance crackdown. It was the sticky substance crackdown. And it might have been 2021. Dude, I, 2022. I would guess, I would guess um, too. Uh, no, it was two because Glass now came back at the... Uh, no, Glass now came back at the end of the 22 season. He blew out in 21. He pitched the full year in 23 he threw 120 innings. So he, yeah, it was 2021. 
that I think is the secondary factor. And I'm going to play you Tyler Glass now right after he blew out, right after he tore his UCL. This was a couple starts after the sticky substance crackdown. This is from the Rays, I guess. This is his Zoom media availability. So this is uh, from the Tampa Bay Rays. I think it was also on Valley Sports Sun. So listen to this. It's about two minutes long, and then we'll cap it. But I 100% believe that contributed to me getting hurt. Uh, no doubt. Without a doubt. Um I think like it's it's ridiculous. Like, I'm just gonna. I have used sticky stuff before. It's ridiculous that like it seems like this whole public perception of like, oh, it's just like select few people. Like your favorite pitcher probably 50 years ago was using something too. Like if you felt these balls, how inconsistent they were, like you have to use something. So in the past, I my like substance of choice is sunscreen and rosin. Like just nothing egregious, something to where I can get a grip on the ball so it doesn't feel dusty. But two starts ago against the Nationals. I went cold turkey, nothing. And before that start, I remember when all this stuff came out, I was talking to people and talking to doctors. And they were like, the thing that maybe MLB doesn't realize or that players don't realize is like, what, what is the injury? Like, what, what is the prevention of like, maybe it'll add to injuries. And in my mind, I was like, that sounds dumb. That sounds like an excuse a player would use to make sure he can use sticky stuff. But I threw to the nationals with nothing. I've never been, a, I don't use sticky stuff to, I don't use spider tack. I don't need more spin. I, I have huge hands. I spin the ball fine. I want grip. I did well against the Nationals, probably one of the best starts I had all year. I woke up the next day and was like, I am sore in places that I didn't even know I had muscles in. Like I felt completely different. I switched my fastball grip and my curveball grip. I've thrown it the same way for however many years I played baseball. I had to change, I had to put my fastball deeper into my hand and grip it way harder. And I had to, instead of holding my curveball at the tip of my fingers, I had to dig it deeper into my hands. So I'm like choking the shit out of all my pitches. My cue I used to use with Snyder was hold the ball like an egg, like nice and loose, be loose. That's out of the window. So I, I now have to develop a new cue. I have to develop something where I can't hold the ball light anymore. I have to dig it deep into my hand. So I'm taking it and you have to think, I'm not a doctor. I know you guys probably know that, but I'm taking a, a fastball, I'm squeezing the ball twice as hard. So all of this is I'm recruiting all these muscles and I'm taking my arm as hard as I can. Throwing Saying is like there's pressure put on your arm when you're forced to grip the baseball in a way that these guys never gripped the baseball before. And I do think that that is a contributing factor. And if you're sitting here and you've got like a ball type thing, hold the ball and squeeze on it hard with your index, your middle and your thumb. If you don't have a ball, literally take your index in your middle, and if you're watching on YouTube, do what I'm doing, and pinch it to your thumb and squeeze and feel what's tightening up. And it's literally shooting right down the forearm, and it's mm -hmm. shooting right here. The end is literally the inside of your elbow. I think that is the most valid non-velocity thing that I've heard, and I, I think Last Now was on it. I, I definitely think it's a contributor, and and I think that's one of the things that they could u identify to maybe take a little bit of pressure off of the arm and figure out just just how to go about that. But I also think that if you never had the sticky stuff cracked down, Tower Glass now probably blows out his UCL again anyways, and he's probably I mean he's always hurt, and yeah, he's a guy that's been always. throwing fuzz forever. He's a massive human, uh, so that's that's the tough part the push and pull for me but at the end of the day it, it if it's something that is 10 percent contributing even five percent let's find a way to to rectify that because i don't really know any solution to the velocity thing there there, there, there really, is no there, there is really no solution is evolution I, I i don't know if we could come up with if there's more research that's done and exercises and ways that you can strengthen that ligament specifically, uh, maybe we find more things out there. I don't know. Uh, but we're at the point now where it's like good to get the Tommy John out of the way earlier yeah. and just, just roll from there. What a like, sad it, reality. And like, Hey, your second is going to come at some point. <laughs> like yeah, it's, it's insane. I put together an all two TJ team and it was disgusting. It was DeGrom, McClanahan, Bueller, Ivaldi, um, Reagans was in there. There's mm -hmm. one more big name that I'm missing. Rasmussen. Rasmussen's in there. He's There's a trio. One. He's with the brace now. Yeah, with the brace. There's one more name that I'm missing right now, and I'm gonna find it. Um, man, 
I don't know. I don't know, but I'll, I'll find it eventually. Um, Walker shoved. Walker kicked ass. We're yeah. gonna get into that in a moment. Um, the team just can't. It, they they can't hurt me. Uh, apathy. But, yeah. It yeah. Is apathy that point. said, disappointed. I feel for Marlins fans. Uh, I will be pissed off in one scenario. If Gabe Kapler becomes the manager next year, <laughs> I will be pissed off. Uh, but the so I, uh, what came out was Bob Nightingale reported that. Schumacher's option had been voided in the winter. So going into the season, they said, hey, Skip, you know, we're we're going to avoid that option, which uh, maybe there's some nuance to the contract I'm not aware of, but I just don't understand why you would do that before the season when you could just exercise or not exercise the option after the year. Maybe they wanted to, to give Skip the courtesy to know that after this year. But why would you want that? Why would you want – you just made the playoffs, and I think that they were a fluky playoff team. Don't get me wrong. I don't. I didn't think that they should have you know, pushed all the chips forward. However, I do think that they should have tried to make the team better. They didn't. Uh, and then you think about what they did or didn't do in the offseason. And then you take your manager, who I think has been one of the bright spots. And if the Marlins overachieved last year, like the, it, clearly the Marlins front office, Peter Bendix feels like they overachieved. And if you feel like they overachieved, you have to look right at the manager and say, mm -hmm. Wow, he must have played a part in us overachieving. So not only does he behave in Bendix in a way that, oh, okay, we overachieved, so I'm not going to do anything crazy to try to add to this team because they're gonna not going to be good enough no matter what. He also says, this manager's not going to cut it for us either. So they overachieved, but the manager's also not the guy for them. That makes no sense to me. And I can kind of theorize why they're doing this, but the biggest thing for me is, you go into the season, and I look. I didn't think that they were going to be good this year, but you got to try, especially when you know you're trying to build a fan base here. You just made the playoffs for the first time in a long time, besides 2020. You finally have some momentum. Why would you want your manager to be a lame duck after a playoff season? Why would you want to go into the year with the team knowing that the manager is pretty much managing for nothing and Skip's a pro's pro? You you wouldn't ever be able to know what the way he goes about his business. I think he's one of the best things that they have going on in the organization, which is the irony. And you don't add to the team. You don't, you, you make it clear that your manager's pretty much on a one year deal. And you have the whole fiasco with, with, with Kim Ang as well. When something finally starts to happen for this franchise, it, it seems like they freak out and they got to make it all go back to shit again. And I just feel for Marlins fans. Cause I know that they like skip. Uh, I know that a lot of the people you know around the org do like Skip and everyone that's worked with him has liked him. So it's uh, you know, I'm happy for Skip. We'll be able to, you know, go to maybe go a to better a better organization. Yeah. And I th this will be the second, you know, so he won manager of the year and then he'll have one year and then I'll go. But the Marlins also, you know, in two thousand eight or two thousand nine, fired Joe Girardi the year he won manager of the year. That was Jeffrey Loria's team, but it's just a classic thing now. And and one last note. I think it's because Skip Schumacher is your your classic manager, where I do think he'll work with the front office, of course, and things like that. But he's a player and he he's a guy that's gonna go off of feel his is, you know, and we talk about like Snit, you know, Brian Snicker. I think he's kind of cut from that cloth where he can tow both lines. But I think when you look at what Peter Bendix wants to do and having the 40 person front office that includes Gabe Kapler, yeah. I think they want to manage from upstairs and Skip Schumacher ain't going to let you manage from upstairs. If Gabe Kapler isn't the, the next manager, I am willing to bet anything that the next manager of the Marlins has zero managing experience. I, I feel very confident about that, that it'll be somebody with zero managerial experience that will just kind of be that, that, you know, yes, man puppet. That's a theory that I can totally get behind. I, I think you're spot on with where you're at there. And that's uh, no information on that. That is literally no, just that's gut feel that's just and me like guessing based on the the way that things have kind of just moved around a little bit. Okay, so if it's not Gabe Kapler, it's someone that's a first time manager. Someone I've never heard of. Yeah, I I can absolutely get behind that theory. I know it's your gut feel, but I'm I'm totally believing the gut feel. And like beyond I'm, that, also, who the hell wants that job? I, that that's a tough one. Like it's, it's a big league manager job. There are a lot of people that would take, but if that. you're a former big league manager, Oh no, nobody wants job? it. That's nobody my point. It. So it's twofold. If I think it's going to be somebody with no experience. Yeah. I, I can totally get behind that. I was going to compare it to um, the Raptors firing Dwayne Casey, but the shit version, <laughs> but yeah. Girardi's the better comp because it's like, you know, th they found a guy to like help them win a title in Toronto. Uh, on the basketball front, but this one, it's just like, 
you're going from a guy that was clearly the National League Manager of the Year last year. Like, it wasn't He's so close. respected in the game, too. Yeah, like, I, I mean, it, like, everybody, as soon as that happened and he was Manager of the Year, people were like, hell yeah, Skip. It was a great reaction. I've never seen a bad story come out about Skip Schumacher, the player or the manager. And here we are, like, cost cutting i i don't know what's going on i don't on. know what they're doing i i think it's it's just getting you know in control and bendix wants to bring in his people and you know we'll see how it goes but uh i the it's the irony is joe girardi got fired because jeffrey loria was just breathing down his neck i think he tried to get near the dugout and i think girardi just told him told him to fuck off and loria couldn't handle that and fired him so again different ownership but kind of the same story the marlins can't get out of their own way and I think this is just the latest example of that. They did finally win though. One in nine. Yeah. Uh, Max Meyer did look, did look sharp. And they beat up, watch Max Meyer do his thing. They beat up the big bad Kyle Gibson in St. Louis. That was, that was, Hey, Hey, you're trying to get the offense going. Just run into Kyle Gibson. Run into Kyle Gibson. I want to wrap with something positive and that is opening weekend of minor league baseball. We are back, baby. It, It is so much fun. And on the call up, we did, the best minor league rosters by level. We also have breakouts um, and there's a ton of corresponding written stuff on just baseball.com to go along with this as well. We're really looking to broaden our editorial reach on the minor league front on the prospect coverage this year. And we've brought in some great guys to do it. And we had guys that were already on staff that are going to continue doing a great job with that. Um, But do kind of want to run through some of the best performances for the first full weekend of minor league baseball, because I was getting back from the ballpark and I was putting on the moon landing adjacent Modesto nuts broadcast. And I was like, you know what? Let's, let's do it. Oh, wow. Colt Emerson went yard. I don't, I didn't see it, but like I heard the call and it sounded like it went a long ways. So that that's a really funny aspect of it because it's killing me because I want to watch those swings. (laughs) Right. That's one of the best teams in the minor leagues. And and Jack and I did on the call up a, a little primer of of all the best minor league teams that you should be following. So even if you're not a prospect junkie, you know, just a slow MLB slate. I'm gonna scroll through on my LB TV or see the free game of the day. Is it worth me watching? Uh or there's a team in your town and you, you want to know if they're worth going to see. Like I get a lot of DMS, honestly, which is, I love them. It's always great. It's like, Oh, I, I'm coincidentally going to be by Dayton. I'm on a road trip. Like, is there, who should I be looking for there? Uh, check out the episode because we highlight some of the best teams, the Modesto nuts are, you know, if we want to highlight opening weekend, if you're a Mariners fan, you can't be much more excited about the way that that low a team has started because you have three of their draftees from this past year because of their, their prospect, uh, you know, promotion incentive, extra picks there. And then the way that they draft has been to just in his team are just fantastic at drafting, but you have Colt Emerson there already homered twice. Uh, this season, you have Ty Pete who's electrifying you get back-to-back games with the grand slam last year, uh, trying to get it going here this year. Johnny Farmello, I think, already has two home runs under his belt, and he motors. And then you have Lazaro Montes, who's the biggest human in the world and, and one of Jack's favorite prospects. And then that's not even mentioning Michael Arroyo, who's a very solid prospect. That is a fun team that if you ever get a chance to see them in person, you got five guys that are either top 100 or, or right on the brink of it in that lineup, pretty much in order. Yeah, yeah it is. It's very, very fun. And... Modesto was one that jumped out. Portland. Oh my God. The Portland Sea Dogs. Like, oh, well, crazy. Portland, th- that team, I think. You should drive three hours to go see the Portland Sea Dogs play baseball. <laughs> While you can. Double A Red can. Sox. You're going to have Roman Anthony, who's a top 20 prospect for us. You're going to have Marcelo Meyer, who's a top 30 prospect for us. You're going to have Kyle Teal, who's a top 40 prospect for us. Yeah. You're going to have even fun names like Blaze Jordan. Uh, like th- It's just a fun team. And then there's some good pitchers as well. Who am I missing? Who else on that team? Nick York. York. Uh, Nick York, who's... Wilkeman Gonzalez is there. Yep. I mean, that's a fun team. It's a really uh, fun That's team. a must-watch ball club. And, I mean, I, I wouldn't say anybody on that team has gotten off to a super hot start yet. No, but not yet. But regardless, we're, we're th- really fun team to watch. We're two minutes into the end of the season at the double-A, high-A, and low-A levels. Um, I do – I'm going to run you through some of the starting pitching performances that jumped out to me on the opening weekend. Uh, and then yep. if you've got some hitters that you want to highlight, feel free to yeah. do so. There was sure. this kid in Oklahoma City – um, that went four and two thirds, two hits, no runs, struck out six and walked nobody. His heater was up to, I think, 96, 97. Uh, older guy, 
non pro I didn't see him on any like top 15 list or top 30 list. Bueller. B U E H L E R. Yeah. That was so fucking awesome to see him chef. Yeah, that guy's pretty good. Uh it's just a little reminder of of just how how good he is. In uh, case you forgot. Yeah. Yeah. Fastball average 94, which is great to see when he's up to 65 pitches now. Uh and, and you know, he kind of talked about it. And if you watch that that other start, the first start, he was really good out of the gate. And then you started to see the command, you know, just wane a little bit because well, he hasn't thrown in a game setting. Just seeing him so dialed in and just I didn't really falter at all. Like he just, it, you didn't see him fatigue really. He looked, he looked like he, you could see him feeling himself. Like he felt, it, and I'm excited to talk to him about it. Like I'm excited to hear his takeaways. Cause like my, just what I saw was, oh, he feels like Walker Bueller again. Mm -hmm. And that was cool to see Walker Bueller feel like Walker Bueller again. Um, That was, that was fun. And I mean, I, I think uh, Dodgers fans can start to, to feel it a little bit. Uh, he, yeah, he's going to be there relatively soon uh and i think can can help them you know sooner rather than later get the fever going a little bit um i want to go to greensboro and hunter barco who we were impressed mm -hmm. by in spring breakout hunter barco went three no hit innings with six punch outs only two guys to reach against him were two walks this was a guy that on a much smaller scale than walker bueller is an in case you forgot guy because mm -hmm. he was good at florida before he went down but he blew out He's worked his way back, and I, we talked about it on the call-up. Like I turned to you during spring breakout and was like, Barco looks healthy, and he looked really healthy in high A. The, the healthy is, is the big thing. Coming off of TJ, for him, at the so he would have been a first-round pick, I think, at UF, out of UF, ends up going you know, undergoing TJ in that season when he was dominating and still goes in the second round. And then we see him come back at the end of last year and the velo just wasn't there. It was 90, 91. And he's more of a deception and, and shape and funky release guy. Uh, but when he's 92, 93 now, because it's a sink, like we talk about with some other guys, makes a huge difference, especially with the slider working the other way. So he's back to 92, 93. And you're just seeing a total, totally different situation here where he's able to get it by guys the slider looks sharper he mixes in the change like th there's a lot to like and uh barco is one of the guys that we just put out a written article of you know breakout pitching prospects i added more than what we did on the call up and barco is one of the guys I actually ended up adding just thinking yeah. back to that live look we had at spring breakout it, he he was he, he looks like you know under barco again understandably so uh a guy in double a with the white Sox, drew thorpe for birmingham Five innings, two hits, no runs, punched out eight, and walked one. Thorpe got blasted in his final spring training outing. I think yeah. that left a sour taste. Poor, in some poor guy was traded like twice. I know. Like, hey, pack your bags, bub. Um, and he threw for the White Sox after he was moved. And like, hey, he didn't, you know, really need to go anywhere. It was Arizona to Arizona. But like, that takes a toll mentally. And, you know, he, he got killed by the Angels. And then he resurfaces in Birmingham. And he looks nails. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's that's the best changeup in the minor leagues, yeah. and and we saw it, uh, you know, just up close and personal. It's great that he can work with Edgar Caro too. Who I'll mention is off to a great start offensively. And then another White Sox prospect. You got to be feeling pretty good looking at this White Sox pitching depth in the system. Noah Schultz yesterday, Dude. their first round pick, who is healthy now as well, had a little bit of an elbow flare up last year and he's going to be on a pitch count this year, but to, to start in high a this year, he's six, eight, by the way. And I think he's extremely young high school guy, four innings, two hits, no runs, no walks, 10 K's, yeah, 10 K's in the first start of the year for Noah Schultz. I mean, the white Sox have something brewing here in the farm system. Finally, he saw 14 hitters and he punched out 10 of them. Like that, mm -hmm. That's a really hard thing for me to wrap my brain around. Mm -hmm. And he didn't that, walk that anybody. Crazy. That That's the big thing. When you see these gaudy strikeout numbers and, you know, they're accompanied by a four or five walk outing, then you can kind of add the disclaimer because it's clear that he's not attacking anybody within the zone. Noah Schultz was attacking high A hitters within the strike zone, and he was just objectively better than everybody that he faced. And touch 99. Yeah. <laughs> like, okay, that's good. Um, yeah. Another, I, I've got two Rockies that I want to get to. Actually, yes. holy shit, three Rockies. Two of them in Spokane, one of them in Hartford. Let's start with the one with the least sex appeal. Carson Palmquist, the Hartford Yard Goats. Weirdo, slot, lefty, like side armor pretty much. Carson Palmquist, five innings, two hits, no runs, one walk, eight Ks 
in double A. <laughs> like they're gonna get fun real quick. I love their strategy now. And just it's fun to see that the Rockies have some sort of semblance of a plan. All of a sudden, with like you have to have a plan when you play on the moon. You gotta yeah. you gotta follow some sort of procedure. I mean, Ryan Feltner just punched out what 10. So like they clearly <laughs> had a plan with him. Developing yeah, plan. yeah. <laughs> no, but so the, their plan has been funky as hell lefties. And we're going to talk about two here. But Palmquist has one of the more unique releases you're going to find. It's fully sidearm, but gets good extension. It's just weird. And yeah. guys cannot hit it. He's going to be a big league starter for them. And I think be a pretty good one because it doesn't matter about the altitude's effect on your, your movement as much when you can't even see where the ball's coming from. And it's a totally outlier, bizarre release. Yeah. Uh, the other funky lefty is Sean Sullivan, who is in high A with Spokane. Six innings, five hits, one unearned run. Didn't walk any. Punched out 13 mm -hmm. in six innings. Sean Sullivan going six innings in his season debut was a feat in its own. Like, you really don't see minor leaguers go six. But if you're on cruise control and you're not hitting that threshold that a lot of these high A, double A managers are worried about you hitting, they'll let you go if you look like you're in God mode. And Sean Sullivan on Saturday night was in God mode. His fastball was in, up, in the upper 80s. And he <laughs> just sit using it and nobody can touch it. Another bizarro release, uh, crazy extension, really funky. It's, it's, you're not, you pretty much don't see any fastballs like from that release. It's like even weirder than Kyle Harrison, who gets a lot of swing and misses with his fastball because of that. So if the VLO ticks up more, you know, that, that would be great. This is just cool to see him, you know, even when he was kind of slipping into 86, 87, still being able to get tons of whiff. I think what stands out with him is that he can really just throw that fastball the majority of the time and, and get guys out. But the curveball was there. The changeup was there a little bit. It's it's a legit three pitch mix that's starting to come together for him. He was one of my favorite breakout pitching prospects. And fair to say he's uh, off to a good start for a breakout. This is probably the closest thing to the Joe Ryan invisible that we've got going, right? It's got to be close in, in like a weird left handed like far out way, but I've never seen a guy release from that low and get that much extension. It's just, if you think about it, you're trying to throw it from a low release, you're going to tend to be a little bit closer to your body to get that kind of extension while still staying low. It, it, it's just so weird for hitters. Yeah. The, the last guy that I want to mention here, and there were other guys that had great outings, but the last guy that I want to mention is the third Rocky <laughs> we're going to talk about. And it's, it's Chase Dolander. And this crop, of college pitchers taken in last year's draft could be like the, the stuff of legends. Like we could look back at this and be like, oh my God, what did we get from the college mm -hmm. crop this year? Chase Dolander in his pro debut, five no hit innings. He walked three, but he punched out eight. He was better than every high A hitter that he saw. Mm -hmm. And there was a behind home plate isolated shot of Dolander and we just saw his delivery and we agreed this looks like the chase Dolander that could have gone one, one. Hmm. Absolutely. And it was funny when I interviewed him for the call up, you could just tell he talked about the mechanical adjustments he made to get back to, yeah. to where he is now. And you could just tell how, how comfortable and confident he was. He was like, yeah, that was you know tough last year. Just not being me. Uh, but we figured it out. And not only that, I added a curveball and I like it too. Like, I, I feel like I've got even more going for me now. He ran it up to 98. And there's another guy that has really good fastball characteristics. Ran it up to 98, picked up a ton of swinging strikes on the fastball. I, actually, in terms of whiffs, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, <laughs> nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 fastball whiffs. Oh my God. He's back. You have one change up, two sliders, two curveballs. Just pure dominance. And he's only going to get better. I think he's only going to get more comfortable. I mean, Rockies, all of a sudden. It's the pitching fun. factory. <laughs> pitching factory. Yeah, they're funny. blessed so, that he fell to them. So two of them went to the Rockies and the Reds, the two places that, quote unquote, pitchers go to die. Rhett Louder, and I, I will mention his start, four innings, two hits, no runs, one walk, five Ks. And like, Skeens was nasty again. He punched out six. He allowed one hit in three innings again. This trio of Skeens, Louder, and Dolander, I'm willing to like stamp that we're going to look back on this trio in five years and be like, how the hell were they in the same crop 
they went top 10. This is amazing. Them coupled with Lankford, coupled with Dylan Cruz, Walker Jenkins, Max Clark. Like This could be one of the best top 10s that we've seen in recent memory. And I don't think that's recency bias that I see. No, I don't think it is. And, you know, usually you look back because you're excited about all those guys with close proximity to the draft because they haven't given you – there hasn't been enough time for them to disappoint you. Uh, But with that said, the the talent that we're already seeing and and multiple guys in this draft that are already either making an impact at the big league level or are ready to just about do that, I I think this could be a really special class. That Rhett Louder outing was just – to me, it was a reminder of just how high the floor is. He just was was picking hitters apart, change up whenever he wanted it, wherever he wanted it, slider wherever he wanted it. And then the fastball, he didn't get a ton of whiffs with it, but everything was on the ground when hitters were able to get a piece of it. Louder's going to get up quick, and he's going to be a high floor guy. Like at, at the very worst, you're getting a four there, and I think you got a, a lot more than that coming. I mean, dude, Shanoel went 11th, and Shanoel, like, he, you know, Throw all your your bias aside, and like this guy at the end of the day had a rule change taking him out of the running for the longest on base streak of all time to open up his major league career. Which this is guy, a joke. It's a joke. He opened his career with a thirty game on base streak in the major leagues. He was at Florida Atlantic last year. He wasn't yeah. at LSU. Like, come on now. He was in Boca. He was in Arm Land. Like, yeah, he's so yeah. Crazy. He's down the road. Down he's the road. Down. It's crazy. Absolutely crazy. It's 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 cool to see him, you know, just continue to get on base and grind out good ABs. But do you have any other any other pitchers? No other pitchers for me. Those were the guys that I really wanted to highlight. What hitters jumped out? Uh, you know, it's obviously early, uh, but just a couple of the guys that outside of AAA, because we've talked about some of the AAA hitters that have stood out. Uh, just just some of the lower level guys. Of course, you have that whole crop of of Modesto just mashers. Right. But Edgar Caro. Well, we'll just continue to be floored that the Angels traded away for a rental Giolito. Caro already has three home runs. We've talked about, you know, on the call up about how he's got a plus field to hit and, and great approach, and he's a switch hitter. And I don't think there's a ton of power projection there, but there's more power than he was able to hit for last year. He skipped tie A, went straight to double, and was just not really slugging much because I think he was, you know, more in fight or flight mode. Three home runs already, sitting the ball hard. He's he's aggressive in his advantage counts. He looks like a, a different guy. And then Luis Baez, a guy that really slowed down in the Astro system at the end of the year because he got it, you know, pushed to to low A and it yeah. just seemed like he wasn't quite quite ready for that. Is off to a great start uh to this year with with two home runs already. He's crushed a few baseballs uh, and and looks a lot more comfortable. Uh but I, I'm so excited from what we're seeing from Colt Emerson already. It's pretty crazy to see how how hard he's hitting the ball and what he's doing. Uh, and I'm trying to think if there's like one or two other Henry Bolte. I want to call a shot there. Okay. Second round pick by the A's. He looks like a different dude early this year. I think Bolte could be one of those breakout prospects this year as well. And then Bryce Eldridge, a lot of buzz about him this spring training, uh, just what he was doing on the backfields, uh, just how he was going about his business. Now just focusing on hitting. He hit a home run that was definitely like a Cal League home run. Okay. But the fact that he even was able to make it a Cal League home run was a pitch up and in. He looked like it was it looked like it was he was fighting it off and it ended up going over the left field wall. It looked like swatting it. And then he hit another double that I think was like 108 off the bat. He hit a home run in in, in spring training off of on the backfields off of Shota Imanaga, like 111. This guy's scary, and he already looks a lot more polished than most six, seven mashers in the Giants system. So uh, look out for for Eldridge. He could have a monster year. Uh, and then last but not least, Farmello, Johnny Farmello, yeah. just swinging it the way he is because he's so toolsy and fun. To see him also just looking like a hitter up there, yeah. look out for him in the Mariner system. It was really nice ending on a positive note like this. Oh, like, I have one last thing. Sorry. Is it negative? Yes. Oh, come on, man. Angel Hernandez, <laughs> seeing how far he can push this thing, man. I've never seen somebody so bad at their job and care so little. And then, like, he laughs. He doesn't care. There's no accountability, whatever. I just think it's the most insane thing that I think the worst umpire we've ever seen in the sport also sued the league for discrimination. Yeah. When he... I, I think the league should be sued for still employing him. <laughs> That's all I got. Okay. I can get behind that. That's fine. That was like, that was negative, but it was funny negative. So we're all good. Um, get your merch. Listen to every show on the Just Baseball Network. We are pumping out great article after great article on the written side. Just baseball.com should be 
your homepage. I, I know some people land on Bing when they open up their, their what, Firefox or Safari. I know some people land on, on Google. You should make it just baseball.com if that's a thing that you can do in your system preferences. And, That'd be great. Uh, yeah, it'd be great. And uh, we'll talk to you guys tomorrow.